Hey everyone. Um, so uh, before class got started here, I asked people if they had any questions about just the mechanics of what's going on, finishing up the term, finishing up the quarter. Um, the last day of the quarter, the last day of finals period is March 20th. Um, so you're going to have exam two due for me um, at the end of this week. And then you'll have like the last week during finals period to um, do makeups for exam one and exam two. Those are going to be open all the way till the 20th, um, the, the makeup exams. Exam two is due earlier because I'm, I want to get it turned around to you fast enough so that you have an opportunity to do a makeup exam. Um, I will be doing a, a kind of grading marathon to make sure that that happens for you. Um, thanks, uh, Betsy. I, yeah, please let me know if the internet goes, goes a little weird. I don't think we're going to have these troubles anymore, but I'm just paranoid now because it sucks when that happens, like on Friday. Um, so, so yeah, that, I hope that answers your questions. Um, the, the, I'm not going to close down the opportunities for makeup exams until the very last minute. So you got all the way up until the 11th hour. The 20th is really a hard deadline for all of this because I'm only given three days to turn around final grades. So that's not a lot of time. And if you don't have it, if you don't have that stuff done for me by Friday of finals week, so a week from this Friday, then I just can't promise I'll have grades in for you on time. Um, so if you're if you're thinking that's not something you're going to be able to hit, we should talk about that sooner rather than later, or just do what you can to prepare to make sure that you hit that deadline for it. But I, I'm not going to um, shut down the makeup for exam one early or something like that. Uh, I'll let you have that opportunity up to the very last minute that I can extend the window. Any any other questions about just what's going on with the class and? Um, anything that's happening with well, the plan for this week? Did my weekend update email kind of do a good job letting you know what's happening? Or anything left over that I can clarify? We doing okay? I'm not seeing anything pop up in the chat. Okay, I'm going to assume the answer to this is no. Um, <clears throat> that everyone, if, if you do have any questions, though, never hesitate to, to reach out and talk to me. As I've been, you know, repeatedly advertising, um, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here all week. Um, I'm making some other uh, opportunities available for Windows for review and study uh, outside of our usual class time this week. I will be holding classes all of this week. Uh, so we're going to be using our class space this week. And then we do have uh, official classes, uh, you know, according to the official schedule, on next Monday. So Monday is going to be a day for... Oh, I just cut out. Am I back? Okay, okay. Everyone else have that problem too? Only for a second. Okay. Um, so... Let's talk about finals week. Monday is an official day of class, and I will probably use this for discussing informal fallacies, and we'll, we'll try to get what we can out of next week. Uh, and I'll, I will also use our finals period, like just as if we were on campus together uh, and meeting on campus, I would use our finals period as a, like a bonus lecture day to talk more about fallacies and just do as many more of them as we can and cover as much of that material as possible. Um, Tuesday is was officially on the schedule called Student Success Day. And the way that Student Success Day works is no classes are scheduled, but instructors are expected to either be on campus and be available to students or to make some arrangement to be available online, which now, because of how we're doing things this quarter, it will be online. But my plan for next week is that on Tuesday, I'm going to do the same thing I normally would on these days where I send out a link to all of my students about the Skype space, and then I'll just be here. I'll just be here for my usual time from 9.30 to 1.30, um, and maybe even a little later than that, just hanging out and seeing if anyone drops in to, to talk about anything that they want, um, to, to do some more review or practice or get ready for makeup exams, things like that. So... There's going to be a lot of opportunities this week for preparing for exam two, and then a lot of opportunities through next week, too, 
for for finishing everything off for the term. So I'm I'm here for you, and you also don't have to wait for any of my official times. Those are not the only times that you can get a hold of me. Um, there's lots of other opportunities, and please please take advantage of me. Um, I guess that's a weird way to put it, but um, I'm a resource here for you, and I want to be used uh, to your benefit. So let me do that. Give me the give me the opportunity to do that by reaching out to me. If the official times aren't working for you, or you just want to do some more together, um, I'm, I'm here and happy to do that. Okay, um, in terms of this week's schedule, um, the plan for today is primarily to touch base and see how the lecture that I had you watch over the weekend, how that went. Um, and if there are any leftover questions about what's happening with the SCT and NCT stuff, the necessary and sufficient condition tests. Um, there are a couple different types of ways this is going to look on on the exam, which we could we could talk about and help you prepare for that. Uh, definitely want to clean up our understanding of that if there's anything to be clarified. Um, and then we've got one more form of inductive reasoning to cover before we're done with the material for exam two, and that is argument from analogy. So I think depending on how things go with our time today, I might be able to get started on that. I'm kind of anticipating Maybe we don't get through all of argument from analogy today, um, but we do a little bit of that tomorrow. And then tomorrow we also can start looking at homework problems and having some of our homework review time. And then Wednesday will be definitely homework review. And then that gives us Thursday and Friday to just do general review for the exam. So basically class sessions on Thursday and Friday this week, I'm just protecting for general review, kind of like a lab that you have to come to. <laughs> it's like mandatory attendance sort of thing. Um, but I think that'll be helpful because exam two's got plenty of stuff going on. We've got all the formal logic stuff and then all the stuff we've been doing with these inductive argument forms. And there's a lot of bells and whistles and nuances and stuff going on there. So um, I, I thought better to err on the side of uh, generosity for our time uh, reviewing and preparing for exam two rather than just kind of plugging away on some informal fallacy stuff that I'm not going to be having the exam on anyway for you. So I, I thought this would be the best way to, to serve all of you is to make sure there's a generous amount of time for doing review and asking questions and things like that. And yes, Dania, I'm planning on ha hosting the lab tomorrow from probably around 1.40 to 3 o'clock. I'll, I'll be here online waiting to see if anyone shows up. Cool. Labs are in the Skype call. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. So any anytime I, I've like indicated on the weekend update email that I'm going to be available, it'll be through the same link that I send out in the morning for attending class. Uh, I'll just keep this video chat room open and you can click on that link again to get reconnected if you come later in the day. And I'll be here. Any other questions people have about what's going on? This sounded good to everyone? Good plan of action? Thanks, Parker. I'm assuming that the nope is not for that question. <laughs> I told you uh, weeks ago that, and throughout the whole quarter, when I became aware of where our schedule is at, that I wanted to treat you right, and this is my best attempt at doing that, and I hope it really does serve you and, and your success in the class and just your interest as a student, too. Yes, I agree. <laughs> this quarter was just the... Uh, last year, um, winter quarter was... A mess too. I don't know if it's just like winter quarter. It's just cursed. <laughs> I remember this. A lot of similar stuff happened. I mean, not coronavirus, but um, yeah. Last last year was weird too. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna uh, a lot of today and a lot of our time this week is gonna be dependent on your participation because I I won't have necessarily agenda here. I mean, you already got the lecture from me and me yapping around about uh, sufficient condition tests and necessary condition tests. So I'm going to open it up now. And how did the how did that lecture go? Let's hear from people. Um, 
what questions did you have? Um, yeah, how did it go? Did it make sense what we're what we're doing with SCT and NCT? Personally, haven't had a chance to watch it, but if we have any follow-up questions, you can contact me. Yeah, absolutely, you can contact me. Um, let's see, we got 16 people in chat. Um, let's just get a show of hands. How many people did watch the video? Okay, one person. Two people. Three people. Four people. Is that it? We got four people? Five people? Is that all? Five out of 16 people here? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, okay, well, that'll make our time a little less productive. Um, one person, though, indicated that they definitely need to do some review about it. Um, can you, uh, for, for any of these five people who did watch the video uh, what stuff do you have questions about and I'll try to I, I want to respect that you watch the video on time um, and follow the plan so I can get you answers today but um, maybe we save some of the review for SCT and NCT and the checking in about it to tomorrow's lecture then uh, let, let, let me answer any questions people have right now um, for those that watch it on time and then everyone please watch that video uh, so that we can we can talk about it together but I, I, I definitely want to have the chance because you just watched a video there wasn't any chance to ask questions about it or anything like that uh, just watching that recorded lecture um, people who did watch it do you, was, which parts of it would you like some clarification about If people want to use their microphones too, that's you're totally welcome to do that. Sometimes that can be a little more efficient. Um, you give us a different counter example for sufficiency. Um, not sure exactly what you mean, but let me let me let me try to accommodate this. Um, let me share our whiteboard. I mean, there there is only going to be one counter example for each of these two uh, tests, right? So for testing claims that something is sufficient for something else or testing that something is necessary for something else, there's only going to be one kind of counterexample case. So that, that's the first thing to say about it. But um, let me just pull up here how this is going to look. So if, uh, if we're doing here... It's connecting you. This should pop up for you in a second. <clears throat> Here. Move my coffee. So if with the sufficient condition test, what we're doing is testing claims that say something like some candidate feature is sufficient for some target feature, where 
you know, we can treat these two things as like two variables, right? But someone's making the claim, this is a sufficient condition for something else. We're going to call those candidates and targets. We can turn that into a conditional by translating it with the system of logic that we had from the formal logic unit. Remember when we were translating conditional statements, talk of necessary and sufficient conditions is a way to do this. And the way it'll look is something like this. Where I'm going to draw a horseshoe. Beep. That's supposed to be a horseshoe. Maybe I can do better than that. Come on. It's so cold out here, my fingers. So that's supposed to be a horseshoe. <laughs> We're going to have to work with that. Um, if some, if this is how we would translate um, a English statement about something being sufficient or necessary for something else. For sufficiency, it would look like this. Necessity is going to be something different. But you remember the way in which a conditional statement could possibly be false. That comes from the truth table for the conditional. If this is ever going to be false, the only way that that happens is if the candidate is true and the target is false. So this ends up being this kind of set of conditions, this possibility, defines the counterexample. So this just is the counterexample. Sort of described formally. <clears throat> so um, when I'm actually, oh man, now this looks weird. My, my, my beautiful conditional horseshoe. There we go. Um, so uh, this, this counterexample is the definition of what we'd be looking for when it comes to the data. So <clears throat> I, I gave you some examples in the video, um, and you got some from the homework, that, that uh, scenario where I have the dinner party and some of the guests die, depending on what they ate, I might be speculating about what was a sufficient condition, which candidate features were sufficient for the guests dying. And I'm going to have to look through that data to see if I can find a case of anybody that had that candidate feature but didn't have the target condition. <clears throat> that this feature was present in that case, and this feature was absent. Treat the F as absent and the T as present. And if that ever happens, then that's a counterexample to the claim that that particular candidate was sufficient for the target. So if I'm thinking maybe having the beef, the beef entree, is the sufficient condition for someone dying for that target condition to be present. Well, if there's someone who had the beef, but didn't die, then I know beef is not a sufficient condition for death. Is that making sense, Cynthia? So when you're you're asking for a different counterexample, what what were you? Did, is this kind of just this review is what you're looking for? In a, in a way, okay. Okay, you can definitely email me later about this, but my guess is if you've got a question, someone else has a question too. So it's definitely good for me to answer as many of these questions for everybody as possible. Um, and that's that's kind of why I want to be doing this group review, and, and I'm carving out so much space this week to do that kind of thing. Because um, I think uh, it would be much better to just, like, have a lot of people get their answer all at once than for me to have a bunch of one-on-one -on -one conversations. I'm very happy to do that, but anything that we can knock out in the space we have together, I'd like to do. Um, I mean, one thing that I think helps with SCT and NCT is to remember that you've done this kind of reasoning before. This is going to be, it's going to look a little familiar with something like testing validity. So remember when we were testing validity for an argument, we were wondering, is it possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time? And if that was possible, then we had a counterexample to the argument's validity. So if we're testing the validity of an argument, we're looking to see, can it fail? And if it doesn't fail, that means it passes. 
And that's the same thing we're doing with testing sufficiency and necessity. We've got a counterexample for that claim being true that we can define formally, and then we have to look and see if the actual facts square with that or not. Is there a case in the actual world now, now we're not talking about validity and just what's possible, we're like, is there an actual case in my data, in the set of observations I've made, uh, where the, the candidate condition is present and the target condition is not? If that's the case, then that disproves that there's this general pattern of sufficiency between these variables. Can I give an example of the reverse of this? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Danny. A, a, a reverse of... What is the this that it would be a reverse of? Of, of having counterexamples? Maybe, maybe it's helpful for me to say this. Um, just because we define the counterexample formally, like in, in this uh, drawing I've made where we're defining this is what a counterexample would look like, that's just like a description. We don't know if there is anything that actually meets that description. If there isn't a counterexample in our observations, like that plot of data under all these different cases and what happened, then that means it passes the sufficient condition test. This, this uh, hypothesis that this candidate is sufficient for this other target, if there are no counterexamples, then it's passed the test. Here, I may actually, um, here, one second. Yes, you said uh, something that shows how the candidate could be false and the target is true. Oh, 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 that doesn't matter. So a case where the candidate is false and the target is true is not relevant for testing the sufficient condition test. That would be relevant for the necessary condition test. So here we're looking at a different type of claim, um, a claim that the candidate is necessary for the target and because if you remember how we translate uh, these into conditionals it's gonna look different right uh, remember remember the the uh, Sun principle uh, which thing goes in which spot here if we're saying the candidate is necessary for the target then the target is first and then the candidate is later in our uh, sort of conditional here and then the counterexample for the necessary condition test is going to be the case where uh, the target is present and the candidate is absent. That's going to be the false case. That's the count. This would be the counterexample case for the NCT. So because necessary condition claims are different than um, sufficient condition claims, um, that's why they're going to have different counterexamples. Does that make sense to you, Dania? Okay, cool. All right. So I'm going to pull up this example. Uh, here we go, causal reasoning, and here we go. I like doing these word problems, because the, there's going to be one problem like this on the exam, and they can be a little tricky. So everyone can see this, um, this chart. Yeah? Yep, okay, cool. So here's all these people I invited to a dinner party. Uh, they all had different soup, uh, different entree, wine, and dessert. Some of them are dead. Some of them are alive. Can I make it bigger? Yeah, let's see here. Make it a little bigger. Uh, this isn't going to fit into my recording screen, though. That's, a, that's as big as I can get it to fit in the screen I'm recording for everyone else later. Um, you can... all. Um, you can find this in your textbook too, in in a uh, in chapter nine. Uh, it's right below the one that I assigned to you about the CPU and the monitor, the computers that are failing. Um, this is one I, I didn't assign for us to be able to do together um, in class. So 
if I'm if I'm wondering, is the tomato soup sufficient for death? So going back uh, to that whiteboard here where I have the SCT and the NCT set up, um, we're looking for a counterexample where the candidate is present and the target is not. So if there's a case like Anne, who had the tomato soup, but didn't die, she's alive, she proves that the tomato soup is not sufficient for death. Right? It's not like all it takes in order to be to die was to have the tomato soup, like the tomato soup was poisoned or something. All right, because we got a counterexample. Anne's a counterexample. Kathy's a counterexample. Doug is a counterexample. Um, Harold is a counterexample. And Leslie is a counterexample. All these people had the tomato soup, but they didn't die. All it takes is one of those. The fact that we have Barney, that he had the tomato soup and he's dead, is not sufficient to prove that having to, the tomato soup is a sufficient condition for being dead. If we want to test it for necessity, we're asking... Uh, we're, we're testing the claim that having the tomato soup was a necessary condition for dying. Now the counterexample is reversed. Now we're looking for a case where someone's dead, but they didn't have the tomato soup, which proves that the tomato soup is not necessary for death. And we have counterexamples like that. We, well, we have one. Irma. Irma is dead. The target condition is present. But the candidate pr c condition is not present. She had the leek soup, not the tomato soup. So that's a counterexample to knowing that the to the claim that the tomato soup was a necessary condition for death. Um, how's this going, people? Good. Good, good, good. Okay, awesome. That is great to hear. Okay, so the the name of the game here is really here. I can turn off the screen sharing now. Um, the name of the game here is just taking each candidate as like a part of a hypothesis, right? A hypothesis, this is a sufficient condition for something, for some target condition. This is a necessary condition for some target condition. Um, you're, you're testing those by looking for counterexamples. And if the candidate is, doesn't have any counterexamples for its claim of necessity or sufficiency for some target, then it passes that test. And if there are counterexamples, then it fails. And on the exam, I'll be asking you to do both. So I'll have, uh, if you've been looking at some of the homework problems there or that they've showed up in when I was giving the lecture from the weekend, um, there's going to be some of those A, B, C, D, G problems where everything is just abstracted. It kind of looks a little bit more like formal logic, but we're not doing formal logic when we do that. But those problems on the exam, I'll be asking you for which candidates fail the SCT for the target condition and which ones... Uh, um, fail the NCT for the target condition. And then if anything fails, I'll be asking you to give me what the counterexample cases are so that I know that you know what a counterexample looks like. And then I'll also give you one problem that's like a word problem, like the one we are just looking at, where I'll ask you for what passes the SCT and NCT. And there you won't have to list any cases because if it passes, that means there's no counterexamples. So there shouldn't be any cases to cite. So I'm doing it both ways because I want to make sure that you really understand what the SCT and NCT are looking for from sort of both angles of it. Like failing and passing are logically equivalent here. If it passes, that means it didn't fail. And if it fails, that means it doesn't pass, right? So those are mutually exclusive categories. Um, but I, I want to make sure you can kind of do it both ways to make sure you really understand what's going on with these tests. So that's what you can expect on the exam. Um, I think I'm going to move on now, uh, and we can start talking about argument from analogy, uh, mostly because not as many people watched the video from the weekend. So I'll, I'll, let's save some space tomorrow to touch base about this again, maybe do some more examples together, um, and see what other questions people have. But for those five people who watched the video, are you feeling okay right now? Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So, oh, oh, here's another one. Uh, so if the plant growing experiment, a plant grew three inches while all others grew five inches for the sun condition being sufficient, would that just be statistically significant at that point that all plants that grew were five inches tall and we could ignore the three inch one? Um, I, so we'd have to specify what the target condition is that we're we're, we're interested in figuring out. In the example I did in the video, I was just like, do the plants grow? 
period. So not not any listing of how much, right, or to what extent. Um, if I wanted to do that, I could I could start factoring that into how I'm analyzing the data. Um, I could say, is this a sufficient condition or a necessary condition for the plants growing at least three inches or at least five inches or something like that? I, I can specify that target condition with as much precision as I as I want to, um, and then I'm going to look at the data in a different way. Um, so uh, you might be thinking of concomitant variation, of seeing like on things that are a matter of degree, how this variable being adjusted adjusts another variable, something like that. Um, but we're trying to look at all of the condition cases, and we're not just like weeding out things that we don't like. Um, part of part of what the book was talking about here is that most causal scenarios are very com a complicated nexus of a lot of factors. I was just talking on the phone last night with a student uh, about coronavirus and like what contributes to the spreading of it. And we were talking about different variables and how it's not just going to be a matter of whether someone was wearing a mask or not, you know, uh, or how we would identify um, the what circumstances are put you at higher risk or lower risk. There, there's going to be a lot of different factors and variables involved in that. And even for whatever sets of conditions we're tracking, it might be a really complicated connection of a few of them. Like maybe, um, and this this happens in the uh, the um, uh, the case with the people dying at the dinner table, at the dinner party. It might be that none of the conditions are all by themselves sufficient to create the target condition, but it might be that some are jointly sufficient. So if you put them together, then it happens, right? Or there could be um, and this is part of the claim about, or the, the difference logically between sufficiency and necessity, um, something might not be a necessary feature. It's not like all cases of that target condition have this present, but there could be a number of different ways in which things are sufficient for creating that outcome. So there can be a lot of other variables that are going on, and dismissing cases is something we generally don't want to do because we're really interested in, a, as much as possible, a full account of all the variables that are relevant that have these um, aspects of sufficiency or necessity to them. Does that answer your question, Cynthia? I, I was, I'm not sure if I, if I was uh, addressing exactly what you were interested in. Yes, okay, okay, cool. Okay, um, so let's let's start talking about argument from analogy a little bit, and I'm going to pull up my whiteboard again here. Wow. Okay, so let's wipe the board here. Okay. So argument from analogy, I expect to be fairly familiar to you. Um, it's not going to be something totally unfamiliar, in other words. I mean, this is a very, very common pattern of reasoning that we use. Uh, let's make a second one. Oops, here. I want to draw this carefully. Let's make it look like that. And then... Let's get a second one. There we go. I'm going to put it right there. Let's, let's first talk about uh, the form of the argument all by itself before we go any further in terms of evaluating it. Um, just what are the moving parts to an argument from analogy? I mean, the basic intuitive idea is that I make sense of one case by relating it to another case. Um, you do this all the time. You're faced with some novel scenario and you relate it, relate it to some other analogous scenario, something you probably have already experienced. So the, the core th start of this is that we've got a what I'm going to call the disputed case. This is the case that we're trying to get a conclusion about um, and we're, we're basically wondering or we're going to draw a conclusion that this disputed case has some property, some property X. Again, what I like to call um, property X. Oh, what is, what's the phrase I use here? The disputed property. So in the disputed case, the case we're not sure about that we want to gain insight on, 
does it have oh oh no 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 i'm sorry there's another phrase i like uh, <laughs> disputed property works out okay but i forgot just for a second here the phrase i like to use um which i've been using for a lot of these inductive argument forms the property in question which is really just another way of saying disputed property but um i like that phrase the property in question so we think the conclusion is this disputed case has this property and the way we're going to make a defense of this to give some evidence for it is to talk about an analogous case uh, i think that's an eight nah. ah man i cannot spell yeah am i spelling that right spellers out there i don't want to embarrass myself i've already embarrassed myself i guess <laughs> am i spelling that right analogous Looking it up. Help. Anyone. Am I doing this right? <laughs> okay. I'm going to look it up. Because I just I don't like having bad spelling. Okay. I am spelling it right. I'm a terrible speller. And modern technology has not helped me. I was a much better speller like 10 years ago. Oh. Oh. Yep. Yep. Wait. What? Are you just messing with me? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, you goofus. All right. Um, so what we're doing here, this is a, a little therefore symbol I'm drawing. So we're saying because the, the disputed case is similar to this analogous case, and I know that the analogous case has this property, therefore the disputed case is going to have that property. So um, we got to get one other moving part here into our little diagram. And I'm going to do it like this. Some of my students in the past have said it looks like a face, and it does kind of look like a face, doesn't it? Um, so we're going to have some other properties, like P... Q and R. And here we go. P. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Betsy. P, Q, and R. It might be helpful to remember it. Okay, so we've got these other properties. Um, do they have to be three? No. But it's just, there could be more than three. There could be less than three. There's just got to be some some set of these. Um, and in the same way, you could have uh, maybe, let's see if I can draw this, you could have analogous cases, right? These could be a, a set of, of cases. They don't, it doesn't have to ju be just be just one. Um, but the main point here is that because these things share these properties, they're also going to share this property in question, okay? Um, so I'm going to refer to these other properties up here, PQR, and so on, as the cited similarities. I can spell that right. <laughs> the cited similarities. So let me give you a really, really simple example case of an argument from analogy and how all the moving parts fit in with this rubric. So let's say um, I, I know you have a car. So the disputed case is your car. I've not seen it. I've not observed it. And I'm wondering, does your car go fast? So the property in question is goes fast, or is like a capable of going fast. And the disputed case is your car. And I know some things about your car because you told me about it. Namely, that it's red. So it has the property of being red. And I'm like, oh, your car is like my car. My car is also red, and it goes fast. So because your car and my car are similar, they're analogous in terms of they both share this property of being red, because I know that my car goes fast, I'm going to think your car goes fast too. That's the logic of argument from analogy. Now that's a really bad argument from analogy, but it still counts as that form of reasoning. So, uh, so far so good. How's this going, chat? Making sense? Yep, okay, okay. So this could happen with anything, right? I've got some case I'm not sure about, and I'm trying to make sense of it by relating it to another case that I do know has that property, okay? 
uh, by them sharing these other properties. Okay. Now there are some. Let's see. I got five minutes left here. What do we want to do? Um, well, let me let me just make sure. Uh, just check in and see if there are any questions about the form of argument from analogy. We're we're not going to get into the standards for what makes it strong or weak just yet. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, but just in terms of the structural elements of what's going on here, does this make sense? Any anything I can clarify? Also, while you're thinking about that, um, let me give the code word. The code word for today is alarm. Um, because I slept through my alarm and barely made it to my first class today. <laughs> but uh, alarm is the code word for today. So no questions about what's happening here structurally with argument from analogy? Cool? Yep, that's right, Adrian. Um... Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if there weren't as many questions about this because this form of reasoning is is very very familiar. Um, yeah, nice, nice joke, Adrian. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's something that we not only use all the time, but we also think about exp a little bit more explicitly. Like, oh, well, they're the same in this way, so it's, they're the same in this other way too. Um, as opposed to something like inference, the best explanation we were talking about last week, where it's like we're using it all the time, but we may not be explicitly representing to ourselves in our own thinking that this is what we're up to. Uh, I think argument from analogy is a little more familiar as as like a form of reasoning um, and even some of the standards we're going to talk about Andrew asks is there a minimum of cited similarities to be able to use as an analogy nope like in my example with the cars there is only one cited similarity that they're both red um, the there the number of the cited similarities is actually not going to matter um, and that might seem a little counterintuitive because you might think well, the more properties they share in common, the more likely it is that they're going to share this other property. Um, and there's there's a reason for that intuition, but it is technically incorrect. Um, and we'll talk about that tomorrow when we get into the evaluation of these arguments. Um, but all you need, so the, the minimum here for an argument from analogy is a disputed case that you're wondering has this property or not, and there's at least one other case that has that property and shares one other property with the disputed case. There could be a lot more though, and very often when we make arguments from analogy, there are either more cited similarities, more than just one, or that there are more than one analogous cases. It may not just be relating one case to one other case, it could be relating this case to a whole set of cases that share these properties that I, I know have the property in question. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so, in my lecture notes for this uh, unit, if anyone's been sort of following along in my lecture notes, I make a little note about how um, there can be inductive and deductive versions of stating a argument from analogy. So the way we're talking about it right now, uh, the premises are something like um, some analogous case. Uh, let's say. Uh, a, B, C, and so on, right? Maybe, maybe just one case, A. Case A has property X. Case A, another premise is case A has property P. Um, the, let's call this case D. Another premise will be D has property P as well. Therefore, D has property X. And stated that way, this is an inductive argument form because if the premises are true, the conclusion is not logically guaranteed to be true. So that's in, that's inductive reasoning, and we'd have to figure out how strong it is. But there's another way that sometimes, uh, especially philosophers, word arguments from analogy. Um, they might say something like this. Um, the analogous cases have property X. Um, and then they say, <laughs> yeah, they're... Sneaking around in the background. Have fun at the park. Bye. Bye. Um, no, that, that's my favorite. Yeah. Um, okay, so let, let me start over here. So premise one would be something like um, the, uh, the analogous cases have property X. 
That's one premise. The second premise is the analogous cases and the disputed case are the same in all the X relevant ways. So we can put up here a, a new phrase, the X relevant properties. So if they are the same in all of the properties that would be relevant to whether or not something has the property in question, then as long as the analogous case has property X, then the disputed case must have property X. So that's a deductive argument. If the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. The only way the conclusion is false is if either the analogous case doesn't have this property, or they're not the same in all the ways that affect whether or not something has that property. Okay? But don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by this way of carving up the argument. Because even though the form of it is deductive, it's going to have all the same opportunities for objections and counterexamples as the inductive model. Um, basically, everything is going to rest on the premise being true that these things are the same in all the X relevant ways. So um, another way I can put this is if you had any doubts about the deductive argument form, a lot of those doubts are going to come from whether or not we have a complete understanding of what are all the properties that it could affect whether something has the disputed property or not. I mean, it, it, to be able to affirm that second premise of the deductive version of the argument requires us to have complete causal knowledge of everything that affects property X, the property in question. That's a big, big thing to claim. So what the deductive version of argument from analogy, uh, it has a stronger support relation because it's a valid argument instead of a invalid inductive, maybe strong argument. It, it, uh, it has that better support relation, but it's way more open to objections on the other standard of what makes for a good argument, namely that the premises are all actually true. So even though we might not doubt the inference anymore, because it's an airtight, valid inference, um, we're going to have lots of questions about where the premises are actually true. So whether you pre... And th this, this is actually a, a weird dynamic that shows up for a lot of different argument forms where you could kind of capture the same logic in something that looks deductive versus inductive, but it doesn't actually make the argument any stronger. So what you trade for not having to worry about the support relation is you know you, that's doing great but now you've got more concerns about whether you're going to be able to defend the truth of the premises right or versus the other way around right like well in the in the inductive version of uh, argument from analogy that I gave you that the disputed case has the uh, cited similarities that the analogous case has the cited similarities and the analogous case has the property in question those premises are usually really easy to prove as being true the only question is, does that justify the conclusion that the disputed case has the property in question? Um, that's that's the tricky part there. So, but evaluating the support relation of the inductive version or the truth of the premises in the deductive version is going to require the same kind of reflective work uh, that we'd have to do. So, it's not really an advantage one way or the other. It's sort of uh, Robin Peter to pay Paul kind of situation. Um, so. That's, that's what's going on there with the form of argument from analogy and all of its moving parts. And tomorrow we'll talk about the standards for evaluating it. Um, so I'll let you go. I know we're, you got a, other classes and stuff to get to. Um, or I don't know what, what's going on anymore for you with your other classes now that everything is switched to online. But uh, if anyone wants to stick around and ask a couple more questions, I'm, I'm on break, so I'd be happy to answer things, and, and we'll get back together again tomorrow. And please watch the SCT-NCT video from the weekend, if you haven't already, um, so we can touch base about that tomorrow, too. Have a good one. Anyone have questions they want to stick around and ask? Doesn't look like it. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. But if anyone does have questions, uh, by all means, uh, I'm here. <laughs>